morning, all. My name is Joel Stockinger. I'm the director for the Joint Trauma System. If you don't know what that is, come back and ask me later. All right. The, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about thoracic, uh, combat-related thoracic surgery. I have no disclaimers. Uh, the background to this, which you can read from the slide, is really based on the increasing need for us to determine how we're going to train our surgeons moving forward, given that the current ACGME model doesn't really entirely match what military surgeons do when they're downrange. MTF practice doesn't entirely match it. And there's been a lot of talk about what's the be what are the best ways to train surgeons moving forward with KSA projects and so on and so forth. But it occurred to us about 18 months ago that while this is all great, no one had really actually done an analysis of what sort of things we do when we go downrange. And so this is part of that project. We originally started with just the broad brush of how many vascular versus thoracics versus abdominal versus head and neck and so on pr uh, procedures are done. And then we started doing a lot of these subspecialty analyses to really try to drill down on what kind of procedures do we need to train on based upon either their impact or their frequency. Um, th some of these studies have already been published. This one is uh, we're working on the manuscript for. But looking at from the original study that we did, about 2.5% of all the surgical procedures performed downrange at roll twos and roll threes. Um, um, are, uh, fall under the category of a thoracic surgery, and previously deployed uh, surgeon, general surgeons have stated that they definitely need more training in thoracic skills moving forward. Um, knowing what we do, how much of it we do is going to be very important in planning how we do things moving forward and what kind of skill sets we place where. I won't, I won't burden that. And so the purpose of this, as I stated, was to determine what do we actually do downrange specific to thoracic surgery to help determine what kind of uh, training we need a as we go forward. The um, overall anal analysis for the study was done using the DOD trauma registry, which contains all the medical care documented downrange. I have to emphasize documented because unfortunately a lot of things happen downrange that aren't necessarily terribly well documented. We don't have access to that. But we looked at every surgical procedure that was documented over the course of 14 years, which is 189,000 plus surgical procedures, and categorized all of them, and of those, 5,300 total turned out to be uh, thoracic surgery of some kind or another. And this is like the one slide that actually has real data on it. And this is basically what it broke down to. What we discovered was that the majority of, the pr of, of thoracic procedures are actually bronchoscopies and therefore most likely related to roll three as opposed to roll two care. Uh, the next largest category was thoracotomy, and this is thoracotomy separate from things like lung resections or esophageal repairs, because we didn't double code procedures. You didn't count, it didn't count as a thoracotomy and a lung resection. If you got a lung resection, the thoracotomy was a given. So 17% is thoracotomies in the absence of another codable procedure. So whether that's resuscitative thoracotomy, thoracotomy, you know, for whatever reason, thoracotomy to oversew bleeders that you really can't attach an ICD-9 code to. But a significant number of thoracotomies uh, were done, diaphragm repairs, lung repairs, and so on. And you can see that there's a, it, it's broken down reasonably well. It's difficult. I, for one, as someone who's deployed many, many times, will tell you we've done more than 133 resuscitative thoracotomies downrange. But based upon medical records documentation, it's sometimes hard to figure out which, which is done for which reason. Because these results really are about what was done, not the indications for them, nor the outcomes. That is one of the, uh, that's a different type of study from what we were doing. The purpose of the study is just to say, what have we done? Because the best predictor of what we need to do in the future is what we have done in the past. About 655, 655 um, so Thoracic surgical procedures were reported out of roll two MTFs. This is a very, very clearly an underestimate of what's been done at roll twos, in part just because of one of the weaknesses of the DOD trauma registry. It didn't actually systematically include all roll two care until about 2014. So if you didn't make it to a roll three, the roll two procedures didn't get into the registry. That was a significant flaw for the first few years of the registry that has now been corrected. So that's a significant undercount. However, looking at what we've done downrange, the question is, are we prepared to do it moving forward? If you look at how we currently train our current generation of general surgery residents, the numbers that are required and the numbers that are actually performed within, uh, within residency are actually listed on the slide. And what you'll see is that while our 
Average uh, graduating chief resident did about 40 thoracic cases. Less than 10 of them were open thoracotomies. The majority of them are, are, are VATs or median stenoscopies. And in fact, our trauma volume in five years of general surgery residency is actually pretty bad. Only 10 trauma cases of any type are required. The average graduating resident has 27 over five years. So you can make the argument that, that we have a bit of a problem if we're going to take general surgery residents straight out of residency training and send them down range to do trauma care, given that current civilian, um, the, the, our current ACGME model, which is based on a civilian practice, really de-emphasizes trauma care. And that doesn't take away from the fact that a lot of the things we learn to do as surgeons are translatable to trauma, but the concept of trauma itself is somewhat de-emphasized. So where do we get this training once you've graduated from residency? One push is to put a lot of folks into level one trauma centers. Problem is, at the majority of trauma level one trauma centers in the United States, the trauma surgeons don't actually do thoracic surgery. Uh, the only significant publication on this was actually put out by Dr. David Hoyt, which is a name that's well known to most people in the surgical community. And his paper said that in less than one-tenth of all the uh, level one trauma centers in America, do the thoracic surgeons do thoracic cases? The fellows come in and do them. The staff come in and do them. Same thing applies to vascular cases. The fellows and the staff do them. The trauma surgery staff don't do it. So it raises the question, can a level one trauma center really provide the kind of sustainment re required? The UK went down this path a decade ago. They went down the path we're going now, down now a decade ago because they recognized that their military hospital system wasn't providing the sustainment required. It was very expensive, and they merged it with the nat national health system, an option that they have because they have socialized medicine. But what they've done is that has allowed them to take their military surgeons, embed them into the hospitals that are the most relevant to what they need to learn and what they need to practice moving downrange, and part of their job requirement is to maintain their skills. They've got a list of all the things they have to do and how frequently they have to do them in order to be able to deploy. Thoracic surgery, general surgery, orthopedics, they're all on the list of the things that they have to do as part of their day-to-day -day job under appropriate supervision of the specialist. And so maybe that's a model we need, we need to uh, look at moving forward. This is a significant problem for the US military. It's something that's gained national and congressional attention. There is a huge amount of effort being put into uh, solving this problem for military surgery and military medicine in general moving forward. If you want more details on this, there's actually an e-poster I have that goes into more detail on it. And with that, subject to your questions. <laughs>